When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say what, farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. When all means all. Anything worth dying for is worth living for. Anything worth dying for is worth living for. My apologies to any English teachers out there. I know that I'm with my theme today ending a sentence with a uh, a preposition. But I still think it's the right theme to have for today's message. Anything worth dying for is worth living for. There's a time period that we go through where we graduate from high school. And many of us have been to high school graduations. Many of us have been to many high school graduations. And the questions that come up, and of course the speaker is usually one of the graduates at one point where they talk about their future and they talk about being classmates and questions come up naturally about what is my future what is worth giving my life for what is the meaning of life when some of these same young people look at the church have grown up in the church have watched us in the church what inspires them What calls them to the idealistic truth their age often desires? The hope of being a part of something that is beyond themselves, something that makes a difference. May I suggest a few things that do not inspire the younger generations? When they experience in church an insistence that all risk be avoided in conversation and relationships. A soil unfertile to honest questions and authentic process. A narrative which always hides conflict or difficulty in the church or in discipleship and instead suggests easy, almost robotic answers to complex situations. A smug moralism that makes application in a host of areas black and white, good or bad, the one right way and then the other bad ways. A church culture that encourages simplistic, judgmental, and performance-based acceptance of other people, their ideas, or actions. For younger generations, risk is often attractive because it offers them the hope of meaning. What is it that's worth living for? And are there things that are worth dying for? Do we at the church of St. Peter and St. Paul, excuse me, wow, that's a bad uh, habit. Do we, as the church of St. Of Saint Matthew's Episcopal Church, are we modeling together the risky Jesus for others to see? All the original apostles were murdered, except for St. John, who was exiled. Most of the first generation of bishops were martyred. The gospel and the kingdom was obviously worth dying for in the early church. 
Is Jesus worth dying for today? But more importantly, is he worth living for? Anything worth dying for is worth living for. Today we look at our gospel reading as our singular text. And the word of God says this in verses 57 and 58. When the, <clears throat> as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. This person comes up to him and it is something that we on the surface would be thrilled with. Someone coming into our church, walking through those back doors and saying to us, I want to follow Jesus. How do we make them feel welcome? How do we encourage them to sign the guest book, have a follow-up letter? We would be excited, we would be encouraged that somebody would want to come into our church and follow Jesus. But interestingly enough, Jesus isn't as excited. He doesn't seem to understand the best way to close a deal. Boxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you sure you want to do this? What a statement of commitment to Jesus. And Jesus, as a Jewish male, yes, we know he was God, but he lay aside the glory of God to become one of us. And he was reliant on the Holy Spirit as we are, but he had an advantage. He was also sinless. He had his full human capabilities. He had the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was able to perceive that there was more going on with this person than maybe they even knew. There are things he perceived immediately. And Jesus says that he and his disciples will have the less guarantee of shelter than even the animal kingdom. Birds have nests. The foxes have holes. We've got no housing. Are you sure you want to do this? Jesus, we often think, we don't say it out loud, but sometimes it's the intent of our heart. Jesus, I will follow you as long as you give me this. I will follow you as long as you never take away that. I am your follower, but I won't risk my mater material security. I mean, that's just crazy. But Jesus says to us, as he said to this person, that isn't discipleship. Having pastored as long as I have and having pastor friends in multiple mainline denominations, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Lutheran has caused me to believe that many clergy believe that the verse in Matthew 6 that says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you actually reads, seek ye first the avoidance of any risk to your pension and a retirement in a warm climate will be added unto you. But he didn't say that. To preach the gospel and to give people hope in life means to risk. It always has and it always will. And that's scary for us clergy sometimes. Because we have to choose if seeking first the kingdom of God is actually worth it. And I'm here to declare to you today that it is. And that Jesus still challenges us with the same things. Jesus is not against retirement in a warm climate any more than he's against owning a home per se. However, what he asks us is what either have to do with our full commitment to him. Can we hold our possessions and our dreams loosely? You see, anything worth dying for is also worth living for. Secondly, Jesus calls another one to discipleship. We're not given the context, but he says to someone, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord. 
But let me first say farewell to those at my home. This disciple comes up with a very acceptable cultural excuse to put off the immediate call of Jesus. Let me go take care of burying my parents, burying my father. This was culturally very acceptable. One of the highest values that was placed on being a member of any kind of Jewish family was the final care of those especially who are your parents. We're not, giving all, we're not given all the context here. One commentator in Matthew talks about the possibility that the person is actually asking to stick around for a while because maybe his parents or his father especially had not died. Whatever the case, what's going on here is not legitimate. He's giving an excuse, and it's culturally acceptable, but the real issue behind his excuse is that he's asked to follow Jesus, but he really isn't committed to the whole following Jesus thing. And he uses cultural reasons to do it. Jesus says to him, essentially, leave death and those things that are about death and come live among the living. And we all know that the funeral of someone is not about the person who has died. They get no benefit, but it's for us that are grieving. Us that are remembering and worshiping God about this person's life and the hope that we have. How easy it is to let cultural values and cultural manners dictate to our form of discipleship. It is a discipleship that is rarely, is it, or it is a discipleship that we often live that is rarely upsetting or even noticeable to most of the people we are around, whether they are family or friends. We're busy. We have things that we want to do, and the rationalizing of what we do and why we do it is often, or does often, go undiscerned or unnoticed. Recently, matter of fact, even this week, there was a family that we had dinner with, and their daughter is college age, and she is seriously thinking about going to a, another country, which I will leave unnamed, <clears throat> to serve in an underground church in a foreign land. Could you imagine that? Your child has just finished university. They're looking for their future. And their choice is to go and serve in an underground church where they could be arrested. And to the parents' credit, they were proud of her and yet apprehensive and praying, as we all would be. But this young woman was more interested and is more interested in serving Jesus Christ than having something that she has learned in the culture of what life is all about. She understands discipleship. That does not mean we all are supposed to go to a foreign country or serve an underground church, but would we do it if Jesus asked us? We often read the Jesus and listen to the Jesus that we want to listen to. But what does he say? Matthew chapter 10. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Wait a second. He's the prince of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. What's Jesus talking about? Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lo lose their life for my sake will find it. Ouch. Isn't it just easier to skip over these verses? All that messy discipleship and completely committed to Jesus thing. I mean, we've got all kinds of things calling for attention, so how do we live this out? Well, I'm here to proclaim to you today that anything worth dying for is worth living for.
Thirdly and finally, another eager disciple. Another eagle, eager disciple. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but please let me first say farewell to those at home. It seems reasonable. And Jesus says, no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I mean, even Elisha, who was in our early reading, he was given permission to go say farewell to his family. <coughs> there was no hindrance there. What is Jesus referring to here? He wanted to say goodbye to those he loved. But Jesus, I think, sees this as a facade for stalling due to insincere commitment. We're wonderful at facades, aren't we? We human are masters at stall techniques and misdirection when we want to avoid an act of sacrifice and love because it may cost us or bring us convenience. But in our culture, if I say something out loud, it must be true, right? I mean, as long as I don't actively commit some kind of harm to someone else, I'm really okay. And yet, every week we pray a prayer that says, Most merciful God, I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what I have done and by what I have left undone. But that's harder to see. See, in our culture, passive-aggressive or the removal of love and support isn't seen as something that's problematic, but not so with Jesus. This is very true of we Episcopalians, even though we have this confession. As long as no one looks too closely at our patterns of behavior, and most won't, we know that we will be seen as harmless moral Christians while in great engaging in all kinds of passive-aggressive behavior or the removal of love for others. Don't mess with me. I won't come after you. I'll just ignore you. I'll make sure you don't have support. Jesus wasn't fooled then, and he isn't fooled now. And no, I'm not, I'm not referencing anything specific at this point. I'm just a human being like you and well aware. Jesus looks at our lives. He sees who we are. And he is a gracious, loving master that calls us to discipleship. He is not trying to harm these people. I mean, my goodness, if you're trying to build a church, why in the world are you challenging these people? Exactly. Because Jesus was more interested in the truth and loving people so that way they would find life than building their nonprofit organization. How about us? Anything worth dying for is worth living for. A safe country club approach to church guarantees future decline because it risks little, inspires no one, and challenges little that is destructive to the future of the church. Following Christ promises freedom, inspires martyrdom and life-giving commitment, and reveals the power and the hope of the gospel to the world. What kind of church do we want to be? Who do we want to encourage and inspire? What will the hope and foundation of our future rest on? I want to give you encouragement that what I've experienced here thus far in my brief time in this church has been encouraging. I see people who love the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we continue and we look to reach out to others, we do so with discipleship in the forefront. Loving them, being patient, knowing that only Christ can change a heart. But we're not just looking for our church to survive. We're trying to open our hearts that our church may flourish and be light and salt in the world. Following Christ's promise in freedom is inspirational. If it is Jesus who is the Christ that we are truly about, then let us remember that we have great hope and joy indeed. We're not given if these people who Jesus challenged ever followed him or not. We're, we're left without that answer.
I'd like to think that some of them did. But whatever the case, when we give out the gospel, we're seeking to love people and draw them to the real Jesus. And it's only the real Jesus that saves. Thanks be to God.